Thank you all for coming. Um, we'll start now. Um, I'm A.G. Harmon, and uh, we founded the Student Scholar Series eight years ago now in order to recognize notable legal scholarship produced by members of the student body during the previous academic year and to foster the skills associated with presenting and defending that scholarship in a professional conference-style setting. Today's presentation will be made by third-year student Brendan Johns. Before I introduce Brendan, I'd like to first introduce the respondent to his presentation, Alex Dunn. Ms. Dunn is the Executive Director and General Counsel of the Environmental Council of the States, the National Nonprofit Nonpartisan Association of U.S. State and Territorial Environmental Commissioners. She has two decades of experience in environmental law and policy and presently works on legislation, policy, and regulatory matters affecting all media, including air, waste, water, and toxics. She has particularly rich expertise in water quality, environmental justice, and urban sustainability, and implementation of the Clean Water Act. She is a published author and speaks regularly on diverse environmental topics from cooperative federalism to green cities. An adjunct professor here at the Columbus School of Law, she earned her JD, magna cum laude, at the, this very place, Columbus School of Law, and she was the editor-in-chief of the Law Review. So we thank her for taking the time to join us today. Now let me introduce today's student scholar, Brendan Johns, is the first speaker in our um, three-part series. He's a third-year law student um, and expects to sit for the Colorado State Bar after graduation this spring. Brendan is the president of the Environmental Law Society, the Moot Court Association Chancellor, as well as the founder and student member of the newly revitalized Energy and Sustainability Moot Court team. Additionally, Brendan has served as a law clerk for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Department of the Interior, and the Environmental Council of the States. His interest in environmental law began in college at the University of Colorado at Boulder, where he took classes in this area. And as a law student, he is enrolled in CUA's Natural Resources Law and Policy class, environmental law, and other classes. Uh, Brendan wrote an in-depth article advocating for a specific amendment of the Safe Drinking Water Act that would shift regulatory authority of hydraulic frac uh, fracturing from the states to the federal government and the EPA. And Professor Lucia Selecchia nominated the paper uh, for the series this year, and we thank her for doing that. Um, that is the subject of his work, which is entitled A Regulatory Balancing Act, Ensuring That Fracking Can Survive in America's Future. I'll turn it over to Brendan. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you all for coming. First off, I want to thank Professor Selecchia for nominating me for this award, and Alex Dunn, uh, my former boss, for <laughs> attending. Uh, my paper is titled A Regulatory Balancing Act, Ensuring That Fracking Can Thrive in America's Future. Um, as, please, as Professor Harmon stated, I am the President of the Environmental Law Society. I, I believe I'm an environmentalist, but I am a conservationist and I think that fracking should be encouraged as long as it's done in an environmentally responsible manner. So fracking is a hot button issue. I'm sure you've all heard about it from seeing documentaries where people allegedly light their sinks on fire to uh, the other side saying we should continue and expand at all costs. We had national security concerns. Both sides have merit to their arguments. Um, there are cases, if this is improperly done and a well breaks, that it can contaminate drinking water. It can create seismic activity, such as earthquakes or even minor tremors. And it has air emissions uh, problems, such as methane releases from when you get the gas out of the ground. I'm going to be focusing mostly on water contamination issues, fresh water, and our drinking water, which is important to everyone. Um, there are pros. Um, most of the, in the past, we've gotten most of our oil from the Middle East and countries that are either unstable or have regimes that are hostile towards America. A lot of the Middle East have terrorist organizations or just things that we would be better off not funding directly. So there are national security concerns. You'll hear that probably a lot in the upcoming presidential debates and, and especially on the Republican side. Um, and we now have cheap oil and gas, as you can see when you go to the pump for your car or you not heat your homes with natural gas. So there are a lot of benefits and cons, and I think that there's a middle ground that we can encourage it in a safe way. So you've heard about fracking likely, but maybe you don't know what it is. It's specifically, <clears throat> it is the process of injecting highly pressurized water 
underground to crack the shale, which would be down here in the brown, uh, bedrock. In there, there is a lot of natural gas and oil, which we previously thought would be inaccessible. However, the combination of fracking and a technology called horizontal drilling have enabled us to go through an energy revolution in the past 15 years. Specifically, once you get into the shale, we now have technology known as horizontal drilling where you can rotate it and you can dig through it. So you can continuously frack, 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 and then you can get as much oil and gas out of it you can. And this also allows you to drill several wells within several feet. Tip Conventional wells, you go one down, you get as much as you can. Now we can go down, turn it, and you can go in 360 degrees, depending on how many wells you have. Um, and specifically fracking, once you inject all this highly pressurized fluid, you create a, a vacuum. And once you remove that, it all sucks out the oil and gas, and that's what you, you pump out of the ground. And uh, it gets the name fracking because you actually fracture the bedrock from the pressurized water and sand goes into these slits holding it open so that when you pull it out, all the oil and gas has an avenue of escape because the sand holds it open. What it sh why it's so controversial is because it's not just injecting water. It's injecting a substance known as frac fluid, which as here is almost all water and sand. However, there are chemicals and the government EPA has determined that these chemicals are found to be carcinogens, and if consumed directly, it can lead to human health impacts and jeopardize whole underground drinking water or fresh water. Um, although 0.5% of frac fluid doesn't seem like a lot, we inject billions of gallons of water every day per well, and that, that, can, that can multiply, and if consumed, really cause some damage. So, my papers advocate for a specific amendment of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Safe Drinking Water Act was enacted in 1974 with the objective to protect public health by establishing safe limits for contaminants that may, be, that may have adverse effects on human health and to prevent contamination of surface and ground sources of drinking water. Part C of the Safe Drinking Water Act has the UIC program which is the underground injection control program. And if you meet, the EPA creates certain minimum requirements that states meet, and then they can control their own USC programs. Currently, I believe 34 states do so. Majority of states do this that actually un do have UIC needs. Not every state has natural gas or oil resources. That's why not all 50 and 34. So the majority of states do ha apply for these and have these programs. Within this, there are six classificational wells, and we're focusing on class two, which are, which are wells that inject fluids associated with oil and natural gas production, and one of them is enhanced recovery wells, so injecting fluids underground to recover oil and gas. Now, taking the objective of the Safe Drinking Water Act, combined with Part C's class two wells for enhanced recovery wells, you, it would seem that we, we provide federal regulation of fracking by its very definition. However, in 2005, President Bush, was, George W. Bush was the president, and it, more importantly, his vice president, Dick Cheney, was a former CEO of Halliburton. He was a, he was a former, he was a CEO of Halliburton a year before he became vice president. In 2005, Congress amended the um, Safe Drinking Water Act to redefine the term underground injection to specifically exclude all underground injections for oil, for oil and gas unless they have diesel fuel. Conveniently, people don't inject underground with diesel fuel anymore, so now it's not federally regulated. It's known as a Halliburton loophole by environmentalists because Cheney likely he wasn't in Congress more, but likely had some influence on their decisions. So this, as we stated, it, it frustrates the objective of the Safe Drinking Water, Water Act. It's supposed to prevent underground injections that could potentially contaminate drinking water, and fracking is known to, uh, to inject chemicals that can contaminate your drinking water underground. Due to the EPA Act, which is the Energy Policy Act of 2005, but Congress, you know, another slam on the EPA to make it the EPA Act, 
Now we have a state-based system of regulations unless you use diesel fuel for fracking. So all states that conduct fracking are in charge of regulating their, their fracking and there's no federal oversight and the EPA cannot do anything about it. Now, there are definitely pros and cons to this. Um, a big argument you'll hear throughout this is that why is this a federal issue? You know, states, states don't want to pollute their own water and, and they're taking necessary steps to regulate it. Certain benefits of state-based regulation are that they've been doing it since 2005 when the EPA Act was enacted. And furthermore, fracking's been existing in the United States since 1940 and way before the EPA was created in the 70s. So they have a lot of experience. And on top of this experience, they have knowledge, state-specific knowledge. They know their geography. They know their, how deep their underground aquifers, drinking water are. They know, they, just, they know the lay of the land. And this experience and state-specific knowledge has allowed them to create what, has been known, what is known as best management practices. Now, this is the best argument for state-based regulation through this experience, they've developed what works best in that state and they've been doing it for a while and they've had success doing it. My paper believes that these are critical. We, although I want federal regulation, the specific amendments I'm asking for must account for these be, uh, best management practices because one, there's not enough federal manpower to go do to day-to-day -day operations and two, why start new when they actually know what works? We just need to make sure the problem is BMPs are only as effective as the state enforcing them. That brings me to potential downsides of state-based regulation. Not every state has fracking, but every state that does now has differing regulations. Some are better than other. They all vary in strength. Um, no federal oversight in monitoring, so the Safe Drink Water Act would have strict liability and have deterrent effects, and we don't have that anymore. Potential lack of transparency, but what I'm really concerned of it is inherent conflicts of interest. You're asking state regulators to strictly enforce their most profitable sector of their economy. Specifically, look at North Dakota. They have a, they have a fracking boom. And you're asking the governor or your, the state environmental um, protection agency to be very stringently regulate what has cr created so many millionaires in profit in the last few years. Although I don't think anyone purposely wants to uh, ignore environmental effects, it, it's scary that it's a potential. And uh, although not associated with fracking, when it, economics are factored into environmental situations, it, environment doesn't always win, as seen in Flint, Michigan recently, although that is completely separate and not dealing with fracking. So the big issue is why is this a federal, pro a federal problem? States don't want to harm their people. They don't want to pollute their water. They don't, well, they don't want to buy bottled water for everyone. However, it's a federal problem because it creates, it requires an abundance of water under optimal conditions. Just shooting all that water down, it has been estimated that 70 to 140 billion gallons of water are required annually, which is equivalent to a year's supply of water for five, pe five million people. On top of that, we're in the East Coast, so you might not understand the real strains on water, but out West, California's got one of the worst droughts that they've ever had, and pretty much the whole entire West is now scrambling for water issues and conservation techniques. Therefore, this is the second biggest use, especially out West, next to, irriga next to irrigation for farming. And already scarce or uh, scarce states, we can't just waste water. We need to be able to use it correctly. And on top of that, that's 70 to 140 billions of gallons of water if we're doing it properly. If we have a spill, we have a well crack underground, we further contaminate more fresh water, and that would really create some problems. And unfortunately, underground drinking water aquifers and surface water don't comply with state boundaries. I think Mississippi uh, watershed uh, accounts for drinking water for 15 million people, I believe, and at 33 states. If you have a spill north up uh, north of the Mississippi watershed, it can go down and, and uh, really influence a lot of states. So it's not just one state's issue. There are specific amendments that, if required, would almost completely eliminate the envir adverse environmental effects. Once again, I'm only talking about water contamination. I'm not talking about air emissions or seismic activity. So the first is required chemical disclosures. 
This is rapidly evolving. A lot of states are doing this because they want to show that they're transparent, I'm not hurting my people, and you know, or injecting is really not that bad. There's few indirect benefits. Once you make it public information, now anyone could see it, so they might choose voluntarily to use safer substitute chemicals or just less of the chemical that they're using. And specifically, a lot of states have been using this uh, website, fracfocus.org. I believe 23 states of the 29 that require chemical, chemical disclosures require go there. And that's important because a huge argument you always hear is trade secret exemptions. You get, think of Coca-Cola. They don't want to tell you their exact formula because then Pepsi can co and copy it and vice versa. So they're saying, I have a frac fluid formula that's highly efficient and if I make it publicly available, everyone has it now. And so my suggestion how to avoid trade secret arguments, because I think they are just a convenient loophole around disclosing chemicals, are to submit them to frac focus, however you only submit the chemicals used and not the specific quantities. This allows responders or uh, state regulators to know what chemicals they're dealing with at, to clean up or prevent future spills while not giving the company your formula. And that's important because even in the 29 states or 23 there, um, they still all allow for trade secret exemptions and so most states are getting away from their required uh, disclosures anyways. The second amendment I asked for is cementing and casing. Specifically, you drill a well, although the construction of well is not part of fracking and has been regulated as part of the process, drill a well, once you do that, you insert a casing, a, a steel casing or metal, and then you cement it in place. All, all, fifth, all, all the states fracking have varying cementing and casing regulations, and I believe at the very least, the exterior of it should extend below the lowest drinking water aquifer. This, the purpose of the cementing casing is that it prevents cracking or well blowouts. If the biggest threat to underground drinking water is that if this well breaks, anything will, any, once you, you bring up the oil and gas, so all the chemicals are coming up too, and if there's a crack, it'll go right into our drinking water and completely contaminate it. The best way to eliminate this is proper casing and cementing, and unfortunately, uh, some construction companies might try to save a few cents or a few dollars and not properly apply the uh, cement. So once again, this should be based off the best management practices. The states know how low their underground aquifers are. They know what type of cement works better uh, in comparison to their ground and how strong and, and thick it needs to be. Once constructed, uh, most states don't require this, unfortunately. Once constructed, they should be required well integrity tests. Pressure tests, which you just put pressure on the well that it will experience when it's actually operational to ensure that it's not just going to crack. And that's very cheap to do, so e that should be easily um, implemented. And second is cement bond log technology, which no state currently requires. Um, this requires you to fill the well with water, and then you drop an instrument in it that uses audio waves, and it can tell by the sound and when it comes back if there's even a microscopic gap in the cement, which could be the difference between a cracked well and, and clean drinking water or not. Um, just to demonstrate, although this is offshore oil, gas, and drilling, um, BP Deep Horizon called in a company to conduct cement bond log te technology a week before it blew. They decided it'd be too expensive, they didn't, they didn't need it. A week later, we had the worst environmental catastrophe of all time. Now that's offshore, but the exact same principle applies that it can tell if it's properly constructed, and I believe these tests should be conducted before a well is operational. They will be a little more expensive, but that's a fraction of what the well is going to ultimately produce. Next is ba require baseline testing and subsequent monitoring. I was shocked to find that the vast majority of states don't require this, and this is an easy way to prevent litigation, unnecessary litigation. What it is, is it based off best management practices, how far can a potential leak go? To what water source can it contaminate? Find that radius, and then once you have that radius, require tests of that drinking water, plants, and soil before a well becomes operational. 
This speed gives you a baseline data to later, if there is a contamination or a potential con or alleged contamination, you test the same water, soil, or plants, mostly water, and it'll tell you, oh, there's more chemicals in here. It gives you right away, you know if it's contaminated or not, because right now, way too often, there's litigation that says, yes, it's contaminated, but that's why we chose this area. There's oil and gas below. There's a lot of chemicals. It's, obviously, this isn't clean water or a good area to drink water from. Those aren't valid arguments, and right now they're, they're being allowed to be used in the courts because we're not requiring a baseline to compare the later data with. The real benefit from these baseline monitoring and subsequent te uh, baseline tests and subsequent monitoring is comparing it with chemical disclosures. Not only are you saying, oh, this water has chemicals in it it didn't have before, but you know all of the wells in the nearby location that are using these chemicals, and if only one of them is using chemical X, and chemical X is here and it wasn't before you started, you know exactly which well is faulty, first off, so you can stop it from being operated, clean it up, and then you know who, you avoid litigation because you know who's in charge of paying the bill for the cleanup at that specific energy company and that specific well. So this, the benefit really comes from the combination of those. Just as the construction and the well integrity test should be together, so should the baseline monitoring and chemical disclosures. My specific solution, it comes in two parts. First, essentially repeal the EPA Act of 2005's definition of underground injection so that you include all underground injections for, to extract oil and gas not just those that use diesel, including diesel, but everything else, because that's the purpose of what it was enacted by Congress to do, protect our, our drinking water from underground injections that could potentially contaminate it. Two, once that happens, the Safe Drinking Water Act now provides federal regulation of fracking. But the big argument is, this is a state problem, and not only that, why should we create more bureaucrat jobs in Washington and this is a state, you're taking away from the state economy. Part C of the Safe Drinking Water Act, UIC, Underground Injection Control Program, right now allows states to operate their own programs as long as they can satisfy, they can show the EPA they meet minimal requirements. All those, all those regulations I just advocated for, I believe should be part of the minimum requirements. And if you, meet, if you show you can properly regulate your own fracking, then you continue to do so. Uh, major not a majority, few states such as Wyoming and Colorado are leading examples and of course they're the ones always filing lawsuits. And, oh, we're doing a great job. We already do all this. We don't need you to tell us. I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about maybe North Dakota or West Virginia that aren't exact, aren't states with more lax regulations. and. They should be doing what uh, Colorado and Wyoming do, and this, as long as you prove that you can, you still operate it, and it creates no additional jobs for us in Washington, This it doesn't hurt the state economy. Through this amendment of the definition and an increased stringency of the minimum requirements, I believe that fracking can be done responsibly in an environmentally friendly way, and then us utilizing these amendments that we shouldn't only encourage the use of fracking, but we can encourage the expansion of it because this will almost completely eliminate potential risks associated with drinking water. Just talking about drinking water here. Once again, the states are pivotal in this. Uh, we need their best. We need to cater state-specific minimum requirements around the use of their best management practices because they know what works best. We just need to make sure that they're using it and not just telling us what works best. So we need a partnership. Uh, federal government doesn't have the manpower or resources to regulate every single well every single day. Through a state and EPA partnership, I believe that we can encourage the use of fracking in a responsible manner. Um, that's, and lastly, natural gas and oil, no one, no one will dispute, are two of the most lucrative resources in the world. However, the most lucrative res uh, resource and most important one is access to clean drinking water. We are fortunate to have an abundance of it in this country, but we shouldn't take that for granted. Certain states out west are already experiencing the brunt of not having large amounts of drinking water, and we need to think for the future. Water is the most important. 
oil and gas are secondary, but if we approach this in a responsible and appropriate manner, we can have both of them. And uh, this is, in sum, my 40-page paper in a few minutes, but you're all welcome to read it. But thank you for being here. Absolutely, and congratulations. That was a great Thank presentation. You. you can see why I um, am happy to say that he's one of the best law clerks I've ever had at ECOS. After his 1L year, knowing very little about environmental law, he jumped right in, and uh, we did a lot of good work together. I really think that what's impressive about Brendan's work is that it's forward-looking. We tend to, with environmental law in this country, we're in a very reactionary mode. So right now, you mentioned Flint, Michigan, we're concerned about lead in drinking water and lead in pipes, and it's a legacy issue. So we can't look forward, we have to look backward and correct mistakes of the past. What I think you're doing well is looking at existing law and looking out to the future. Right now, there happens to be a bit of a drop in the amount of fracking because, as Brendan properly mentioned, the price of, of oil is down. And so all these fuels in our country's portfolio are competing for our dollar. And we're always going to go for and have access to the cheapest energy. So right now, there's a little bit of a lull. In fact, a few weeks ago, someone who works almost full time in the fracking business said, fracking's pretty much dead right now. Well, that's OK. This is the perfect time to be thinking about public policy and what we need to put in place. So I think your work is pretty timely. Mm. It really looks at one particular problem, which I think you acknowledged well, to say that you're just looking at you know, the drinking water impacts, because if you look at fracking and some of the folks that, that might be protesting, like your last slide, they have a wide range of concerns beyond just drinking water impacts. They're concerned about um, methane and other gases. They're concerned about essentially cumulative impacts of the activity. So when, when Brendan mentioned sand, being used to um, keep the, the uh, spaces open. What's interesting is I work with the Minnesota Commissioner of Environment, and he said, you know, when fracking was big, we had all these people coming to Minnesota for sand. They weren't fracking in Minnesota, but they were taking truckloads of sand out of Minnesota and driving it to Pennsylvania to support all the activity. So some of the um, opponents of fracking are looking at the holistic, the cumulative impact, not only just in one place, but mm -hmm. in a whole geographic area and some of the trade-offs. So I guess one question might be, um, if you were to sort of take this to the next level and mm -hmm. go another 43 pages, which I, I hope is not in your immediate plan, yeah. uh, but if you, <laughs> if you were, um, might you consider exploring some of the other um, environmental impacts of hydraulic fracturing? That's a good question. and. Uh, <clears throat> Certainly think that other environmental impacts need to be addressed. Um, as Professor uh, Dunn just stated, uh, with the sand and interstate commerce, um, we are pumping not as much as past, year, past few years, but the Bakken Shale in North Dakota is pumping more oil and gas than they can, they can do with. So they're just transporting by rail as fast as possible. And now we're seeing a lot of rail spilling, and that's going right to our surface water, which is fresh water that we drink, or into rivers. So we need to regulate the transportation from inter and potentially use interstate commerce or some constitutional law argument, but we are, we're pumping these in areas where the cities aren't, and we're transporting them to the cities, and we need to account for doing that in an environmentally responsible manner, because right now we're having more train spills with oil and gas than well, oil mostly than we're used to. Mm -hmm. um, Another environmental harm that I would be really interested in looking at um, would be seismic activity. Mm -hmm. There is mm -hmm. concerns with air. Air I'm not sold on yet because uh, it reduces carbon in the air. So less, gre less greenhouse gases in that aspect, but it increases methane, which retains uh, heat at a much higher rate. So it, I'm not completely sold if it's completely helping or hurting, you know, there are creative arguments for both. Mm -hmm. However, seismic activity, I don't really see an argument saying it's not happening besides ignoring facts and science. Um, what we're doing is we're injecting large amounts of water and chemicals to crack the bedrock, and that's where we're getting the oil and gas from. 
that's where these increased seismic activity is occurring. You look at Oklahoma, they're having more, it's, they're not on a fault line like California, and they're having all these earthquakes. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a solution for that yet, but if I were to add another portion of this, I think I would really focus on seismic activity, see if there's, it's tough because the whole thing requires cracking of the bedrock, but there's gotta be something that can minimize it, um, and that's what I would really wanna look into. I, I think that's a great example, and in fact, in the trade press this morning, some environmental groups have just filed a lawsuit against Oklahoma for permitting this type of activity and allowing it to go forward um, and raising concerns about the seismic activity. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great area. The other thing I was thinking about in listening to your paper is focusing on the Safe Drinking Water Act, which actually right now there is a lot of attention to it because of what's going on in Flint, Michigan. And it's a very, it's, it's one of the weaker environmental statutes. It is not as um, rigorous and, no. and um, thoughtful as some of the other statutes. And I think you've, you've raised mm -hmm. that not only through the artful Halliburton example, but, but it, it, it relies on a lot of action and alert levels, but it keeps a lot at the local level and a lot of very um, site-specific decision-making. So it's not one of these red light, green light statutes. It's, uh, there's a lot of range of response. That's how in Flint, it wasn't clear that people should provide notice about the lead because it was within a range. And so it's deciding when within the range you might wanna let people know that they could be getting sick. So it's not the strongest statute. Mm -hmm. So I think you've, you've looked at a law that, and you've looked at ways to make it tougher. Um, what I was thinking about is, is the fracturing of environmental law, right? So we could look at some other statutes um, that also could mm -hmm. address some of the impacts of hydraulic fracturing. So there might be some of the solid waste laws that could be useful. You mm -hmm. mentioned clean air. So there may be some other tools in sort of the environmental toolbox aside from the Safe Drinking Water Act that could be possible um, uh, complementary activities to this. Mm -hmm. So what would be great to see is not just a surgical amendment to the Safe Drinking mm -hmm. Water Act, but maybe a, a series of amendments across the statutes that really address the risks associated with yep. hydraulic fracturing holistically. And mm -hmm. I wonder what you might think about that. Once again, I think that's a great approach. Um, we talked about the methane release. Cleaner Act could certainly cover that, um, help reduce it or at least monitor it. Um, another thing with the Clean Water Act, it could be used for uh, all these chemicals we're using and especially if there's surface spills. Mm -hmm. um, Safe Drinking Water Act really, our drinking water, but Clean Water Act covers our water and uh, such as rivers and streams and stuff like that. And a lot of times, not purposely, there are spills on the surface that go into our rivers and, and uh, waters. And so the Clean Water Act could be utilized mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then potentially, I would have to continue to think about this more, but we are injecting chemicals underground and we're not necessarily, we're not even trying to guarantee that we're taking them all out. So is that a circle mm -hmm. issue where, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Superfund and cleaning up hazardous waste sites. I think it could, an argument could be made that these are, could be surplus sites because we're not trying to take these chemicals out that are carcinogenic and hazardous to human health and it, and the environment, um, that's a tough statue to get out of. So I don't. Th that one would take a lot of resistance, but it's worth it's worth thinking about. So I think the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and Circle could definitely apply. Yeah, absolutely. And then maybe a final thought that I had was how to how to really bring your recommendations to light. So we all know that Congress is quite a bit dysfunctional these days. And so thinking that they could surgically amend the Safe Drinking Water Act, let alone what we just talked about, which would be thoughtfully in sequence <laughs> amending all the environmental laws to holistically manage the risks associated with hydraulic fracturing is, is sort of a, a wishful thinking. And, and so I've spent a lot of time in, in my work thinking about how you can get these practices to start happening in the real world and then Congress catches up. So one thought was whether the concept of private environmental governance, which is really gaining a lot of steam, this is the concept of Walmart deciding that it's gonna reduce its greenhouse gas imprint voluntarily. The, the company says as a corporate ethic, we will make these changes because of course it's good for our bottom line, it's good for our shareholders, it's good for our public image, et cetera, et cetera. But 
it's a whole nother world of control, which is corporate self-governance. Mm -hmm. Now, not everyone has a lot of faith in corporate self-governance, and I think there are plenty of reasons to question it. But I wonder here if one of the ways to advance these good ideas is to get a couple of pioneering companies that are willing to take this idea of the deeper casing that mm -hmm. you suggested or um, the more uh, transparent disclosure of yep. chemicals and, and actually get them to start doing it. What, what tends to happen is regulation falls very far behind actual practice, diesel being a great example. Yes. By the time diesel was outlawed, nobody was using it anymore. Technology had changed. And so could we seize corporate desire to keep their market share by performing a little bit better mm -hmm. and incentivize some of these behaviors so by the time you might get the legislative action, there's already proof that it works? I think there's definitely room to do that. Um, the best example which I touched on is the chemical disclosures in fractfocus.org. Um, don't quote me on this, but I believe it was set up by Halliburton. Um, these companies are now voluntarily using it because there's, one, it makes them look good in the eyes of the public. I'm not a big, bad energy uh, industry or, you know, so the companies are actually doing it. And once Halliburton, a superpower in this field, did it, now a lot of companies are also doing it because they, if this company is doing it and I'm not, the public, is, what's wrong? What are you injecting in the ground? There's got to be something wrong there. So a domino effect has already happened with chemical disclosures, and that has transpired to state levels. Now we have 30-something states that are now voluntarily disclosing or well, requiring them to do it. So it started with the company creating this website for transparency, and it has continued. Mm -hmm. um, casing and cementing, I think that if we can figure out a way to incentivize them, that's, that would be huge, because that is the most important layer of protection we have. Um, it sounds elementary to have that cement is protecting us, but it really is. And we, we need to account for what type of cement each state should use, how thick it should be, and testing it to make sure it's not going to break. But the best example to Ms. Don's question would be with regard to the, it's already happening with the chemical disclosures. And I don't see why, if we don't create websites or somewhere the public can access it for other aspects, why it wouldn't have the same effect. And, um, my paper calls for amendments for Congress, and that's, that's, that's hard to do. So I think that anything to get the ball rolling is a great idea. Mm -hmm. I'm going to open it for a couple of questions just a second, but I've been working with the president all the time to get him to submit this for publication. Would this be something um, that you would suggest he do with the article is, yes, this would be, a, this is what I'd have done. Amend this, this, this. However, failing that, mm -hmm. practically speaking, and then introduce these things to say these small steps might eventually take us to this eventual hope. But for right now, this, 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 and this would be some practical things that could be done. Could that be a way to get modified the work? I, I think it actually would be the best way to move forward with legal scholarship because sometimes it can be viewed as operating in a little bit of a bubble, right. sort of a perfect world. And, and here you are a student in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. You, you know about sort of how policy is made, if you've had a chance to experience some of it through EPA and so forth. And so by laying the nice foundation, it's, it's a good narrow issue. He's not tackling all the statutes. That would be too much for a paper, mm -hmm. candidly. So acknowledge sort of, hey, I'm only looking at one piece of this, and, and I recognize there's other pieces, whether you just sort of take that out of the way and say, but for the piece I'm looking at, this would be sort of the wish list, but this is another way to get it done. And, and I do think the timing, as I said, is quite good mm -hmm. because I think there will be some attention on the Safe Drinking Water Act going forward. I think people are realizing why didn't the Safe Drinking Water Act prevent what happened in Flint? And, and it is, as I said, it is not the most robust of the statutes and, and it's a good time to okay. be looking at it. It's, it's, it's one that people skip over, fr frankly, often. They look at the other laws as being mm -hmm. much more dynamic and full of um, interesting provisions. I think that's Okay, will you do that? Yeah. yeah. Sorry to create more work no, for you. No, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I will. I thank you to do this. Uh, questions from the hall. Uh, following up to Ms. Dunn's last point about uh, incentives, or maybe that's just the way that I interpreted it, um, are there any, uh, I guess, like a combination carrot and stick approach? I mean, you can certainly penalize you know, companies for not doing things, but 
Um, have, has there been any discussion about tax credits or other types of incentives that you know, would put more into the bottom line of this? So that's a good question, and one I should probably conduct a little more research before I do these revisions. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think it's a good idea. You know, solar power hasn't fully taken off, but a lot of people put solar panels on their roofs because they get tax incentives and tax breaks. Um, and if you apply that to the corporate level, because the, the individual mom and pop can't conduct fracking in their backyard, I think that it could be a quite sizable tax break. and. I would be pro that if we, if you can demonstrate that you're meeting these minimum requirements, these more stringent minimum requirements that I'm advocating for, if you can pro prove you're doing it in an environmentally responsible manner, I think that you should be rewarded for uh, taking into account not only your bottom line cause it, the, and the public safety, because these amendments are more expensive than what they're currently doing. It's why they're not required. But I think we should reward people for paying the extra dollar to ensure that people are safe. So I will I'll have to get back to you with a, with a good, better answer. Uh, and just to, to add on, I, the concept of beyond regulation is, is sort of the term, which is someone who goes or an entity that goes above and beyond might get um, reduced inspections. And that recognizes what I think Brennan did well, which is the limitation of resources. The, 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 the state of Pennsylvania can only go out and look at so many wells in a given time period. And so if you can, uh, a lot of states are looking at ways to risk prioritize their resources. So if you've got a beyond regulation mm -hmm. entity that's already made commitments to do more, maybe you can say, hey, I'm gonna put them on my second tier inspection list. I'm gonna go spend more time in the field with the facilities that haven't quite stepped up. Doesn't mean you're not gonna have a BP type situation or you know a, a high profile event. That will happen, it, it, it's the nature of industrial activity. But I do think it could help with an efficient use of resources, which mm -hmm. could be another supporting argument. So it's not like reward points on credit card. I mean, you, you earn less. Right. You do more. You spend more on your thing. You, you spend less, more, but you're, stuff. you know, you're you're sort of um, in, incentivized to do it because you get less um, visits by the by the state. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to drive you in the opposite direction. Okay. I'm being practical. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if there's a if there is support for your why it should be the federal government argument. In the um, uh, a fact that there is a multi-statute um, at least approach um, yep. to the whole issue. So you focused in on clean, no, sorry, on safe drinking yep. water, and we recognize there's also clean water issues and maybe CERCLA and mm -hmm. um, other issues. Is, is that <coughs> same division present in the risks associated with fracking? Like, is there a possibility that there's tension between um, reducing seismic activity? and reducing clean water, drinking water effects, or is um, the technology such that the um, safeguards in one area would also help protect in another area, or is, or is it a trade-off? So right now, with those two that you identified, there aren't any protections for seismic activity that I know of. That's why it would be the one I add to. What are they doing for that? Mm -hmm. NRDs, no, not NRDs. Um, U.S. Geological Survey, maybe. Um, they have a statute and regulations? No, but they, they conduct, they, I don't know for this issue, but they co conduct surveys every year. Yeah. 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 And so this would probably be something under them, but um, yeah, they, they typically do a lot of research, and then uh, they're not like the EPA going out and enforcing things. But I think it would have to go to them. But seismic is, is I have no answers for it now because you're purposely cracking the bedrock. So, and it's gonna have some effects like this. But, um, so I don't think it's combined with the water issues. Um, and I believe your first question was, what are arguments for, why it should be? No, I was thinking about, um, I was thinking that if, you made a point earlier yeah. that um, uh, the water, the cleanness, cleanliness of the water doesn't respect state boundaries, mm -hmm. right? So, Oklahoma, and I don't want to pick on them because I don't know about Oklahoma, but there's been a lot of seismic activity there. If, if Oklahoma is regulating as a state in such a way that they're saying, well, whatever, we don't mind a few earthquakes here and there, um, but 
but a, a neighboring state mines it because of the way it affects yeah, this is the fracture might have can't go to a It certainly can. Can I just touch on that a second? Because just this past weekend we had a magnitude five point one mm -hmm. earthquake in Oklahoma. It's the largest one yet to fracture. And to give you an idea, that affected nine neighboring states. And prior to 2009, Oklahoma had on average about two earthquakes a year. It last year had over 900. Wow. Yeah, they're, and they're definitely the, the epicenter. They are. So they became the world's largest center of seismic activity. Yeah. yeah. So, so, but suppose they were willing to say, okay, as a state regulator, I'm willing to accept that, but it's affecting other states too. That's obviously mm. that's, that's her argument. That's, 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 right. Right. that's right. That's the argument that I believe. Is, is present there that you know I, they don't as long as I'm getting these resources it might have some effects on my neighbors but you know this is a state regulation problem I'm not nervous the EPA is going to come down on me so I think it needs to be um, regulated federally uh, just that earthquake could have affected nine states and then there's underground aquifers that they're welling from because Oklahoma, some states are drier than others, and it's, they're not getting their drink water from rivers. A lot are getting it from underground aquifers, and these span multiple states. So you crack, you crack that that earthquake happens, and it cracks one of these casings most likely, and then the, it leaks out into an aquifer. This can spread through several states. So I think the combination of how much water is used every day just to do this is already that's a huge strain but when you have risk that you're going to contaminate stuff that's not planned to be contaminated and this creates a huge federal issue so you're starting to get people anxious about okay <laughs> uh, so then I, I, would, I think your next paper should be figuring out um, what statute or regulation state or federal could be used to address the seismic impact issue. I agree I, that would could, I have to conduct some more research on that one <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. I know there's a lot of obviously there's a lot of tension with the water aspect of it, okay. and because of that, there's a lot of things being proactively done with this legislation. But is there anything being done in the meantime that's you know kind of mitigate the the lapse in time between the passage of maybe a proposed legislation if an event were to occur, whether it be seismic or um, massive contamination of water, or that you know of? So. This, that brings up one of the problems I see that I wanted to address in this paper is that what's being done is at the state level. If states are solely responsible for regulating fracking, and if you ask any of the states, they're doing an above and beyond job. They're doing a great job. I don't need this That's new right. legislature because I'm doing a great, <laughs> she represents the environmental states, so she's on the state side of this. <laughs> So if you, ask the e <laughs> if you ask the ECOS executive director and general counsel, they're doing a great job regulating this. So they're not necessarily creating new legislature like what I'm asking for even at the state level. However, there is a trend, especially chemical disclosures, and some of the, better, some of the states that frack a lot, like Wyoming, are doing such a phenomenal job that other states are like, you know, I, I, they're doing something good over here. I need to copy because... Mm -hmm. They're really taking care of it, but I would just want, if everyone was applying their regs, I'd feel better about it, but I want something to require everyone to have that same stringency. I don't want just Wyoming responding to every lawsuit against the EPA showing, hey, we do a good job, and then the ones that don't do as well hide in the back. So um, my answer would be that there's nothing that I know of right now besides just little improvements as, such as disclosing because they believe they're doing an adequate job. Just yesterday, the Oklahoma Corporation Commission was Oklahoma. There's about as pro business as any regulatory mm -hmm. body can be. I mean, they are exceedingly pro business. Yeah. They finally did clamp down a little bit mm -hmm. and said that the wastewater produced by fracking has to be reduced by 40% in Oklahoma, which is a, yeah. a, big, a big concession to the environmentalists in the state. Yeah. So wastewater, I guess, you know, I only had 20 minutes to, to bring up. When you use this frac fluid and you're using all the billions of gallons, it's contaminated now, even though it's 0.5% of it is chemicals. You can't consume it for human, human consumption or recreation or anything that we'd want to do with it. However, you can recycle it and you can use it maybe two or three times until it's just, you need fresh water. That's why you can't use salt water, unfortunately. But we have a lot of that. But after you, we should be recycling it so that you can minimize how much water you're using, especially in states like Oklahoma. 
Um, and Oklahoma is very pro-business, and I'm interested. I would love to see more pressure on them because they actually have effects. And, and you go to read, I, I was reading Texas's um, Railroad Commission was saying that, mm -hmm. no, it does not cause uh, seismic activity, fracking. But you go one state north, and it's, it's coming pretty hard to ignore it because mm -hmm. um, although fracking has existed since the 1940s, it has only really boomed in the last 15 years once we started horizontal drilling and we have improved technology. And since that time, the earthquakes have skyrocketed. So um, hopefully the policymakers in certain states or uh, industries start to acknowledge the facts, which is a little scary when you watch the uh, presidential debates right now. <laughs> well, um, Brennan, and uh, thank you so much. A great program. Uh, I have something for you oh, from the school. Um, I'll give it to you, but it's not your name on it. So give it back to me now. But thank you so much. Thank great, you. great. Thank program. you all for coming. And thank yeah. you all for coming.